of you that are here that need prayer because the anointing that God has put into this ministry from the foundation of the world has raised the dead. It has done everything that you could conceivably think of and it will keep on doing it. So, so when you come up here, I'm not worried about your faith. I know the anointing is doing what it needs to do. I'm following what God's telling me to do. I, you know, it, it's gonna, it says the, the anointing will destroy the yoke or break the yoke. And that's exactly what the anointing is going to do. Now, when, when the, the church, but it says, but denying the power thereof. Now, the church has a form of godliness, but they deny the power. How do they deny the power? Because when I, as, as a prophet, and I travel this world and have for years, and the thing that I keep saying, where, you know, where, where is, where is the, the, the spirit of Elijah that's to be in the church in the last day? Where, where is, where's that spirit at? Where, where is it at? Where is it that the greater works are at that, 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 that the Lord Yeshua himself promised that we would do? He said, all that I have done ye shall do, and even greater works shall ye do. The church isn't even doing the works that he did, let alone the greater works. And folks, if I've read my scripture correctly, and I'm sure that I have, and you'll agree that he's coming back for a church that is full of power and glory. He's not coming back for, for a bunch of people that are running around, falling on the floor, uh, the Holy Ghost goosebumps running up and down their spine, thinking they've had church. He's coming back where, bless God, that, that, that the manifestation of the Lord God himself is present. So, so when you begin to look at that, you begin to realize that. But, but, it said, but look what it says. From such turn away. People come to me, write to me, bless God, and say, well, Brother Deckard, I don't go to church anywhere. I suppose you're going to rebuke you. And I said, no, I'm going to give you a hand. Because let me tell you something, you're better off not being in church if you're going to go somewhere where they're denying the power of God. Where they're denying the power of God. It says, from such turn away. Now, that, I didn't make that, that up. That's what the scripture says. And people say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm telling you what you're supposed to do. You study to show yourselves approved. You get yourself involved with a good prophet and you begin to study the materials. You begin, you, you, begin to, you begin to digest that into your spirit, man, and into your mind. And begin to understand something. That bless God. And you know, I, I've always told people, and I, I, in fact, I told a brother here of, of, of quite some prominence this week. Uh, he called and we spoke a, a, at length. And, and, I, and I told him, I said, brother, what do you know about horse racing? Anything? No. He said, I know they go to the track and they bet on a horse. And if it wins, they make money. I said, let me tell you something. Don't be betting against this horse. I said, this horse right here has had years and years and years and years involved in prophesying. As I said, I travel this world and I have to give prime ministers and, and presidents. I, God insists that I give them a sign. Every, every, you, you start looking. I don't know whether I got anything back there on the signs or not, Donna. Did we bring any tapes on signs? Bless God, there, there, she said there's one there's a single tape back there. That, that's the way they knew the prophets were prophets. They gave signs. You come to me and tell me a prophet, you know what, and, 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 if, I, and if something happens that I'm going to somehow think that I'm going to get rela have a relationship with you prophetically, you know what I'm going to tell you? You give me a sign. When that sign comes to pass, me and you get in business. You say, no, well, wait a minute. No, no, don't wait a minute. You're talking to a man that I put my ministry on the line day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year and have for years. And I'm going to tell you something. Prophets give signs. And I didn't come here tonight to give you a sign to impress you I'm a prophet. I'm not, I, I didn't, I'm the, there's no sign that I know of that I'm to give anybody tonight. But I'm going to tell you one thing, that if you are a prophet, you will give signs. And if you don't give signs, then what am I going to say you are? Well, I don't have any idea. You better pray and ask God what you are. All right? It says, anyway, turn away from them. Get away from them. Stay away from them. Look, 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 down, look down there in, this, in the seventh verse. Ever learning... And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what the church is. We're ever learning. We're the most educated church that's been on the face of this earth. And we can't come to the truth of anything. We can't come to the very truth of the fact of who God is and what God is. Now Donna talked a, a little bit about Noah. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, uh, turn with me in the sixth chapter. I'm going to hit a couple verses there. And we're going to go in the sixth chapter of, of uh, Genesis. And I, I want you to... I want you to, to notice some things. Number one, if he hadn't have done what God told him to do, and this whole thing, is uh, this chapter here, if you haven't read it for a while, it would be good that you do read it to, to remind you 
that bless God, that, 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 that God gave him certain things to do. And, you know, I said before, if he had not have built that boat out of, if he had built it out of something besides gopher wood, it would have sank. Why? Because it wasn't the instruction of God. God, and here's the word again, pacifically gave instructions. God is specifically given instructions for this time and this hour of this great plague that's coming to the face of this earth. Now, how many people is going to listen to that? I've got no idea, but I'm going to tell you one thing I know that we discussed up here in the front here uh, at the end of that last session that Donna did. Because of this Y2K thing that came that didn't happen, huh? All the books that were sold, all the TV appearances that happened, and all the prophets that stood up and said, Thus saith the mouth of God. At the, uh, the tick of midnight on, on that date, uh, all the computers of airplanes are going to fall down out of the sky. And my Lord, it went on, it went on, it went on, didn't it? And then all of a sudden, if you, if you was in my neck of the woods, you heard this prophet screaming at the top of his lungs, there's not going to be any failures. Uh, there's not going to be no airplanes falling out of the sky. None of this stuff's going to ha happen because the year 2000 means nothing to God. Not the Hebrew calendar. It means nothing to God. And the fact of it is, nothing happened, did it? But, but it, and because it didn't happen, now listen to me, we yelled wolf, and nothing happened, Y2K. Now the prophets are saying, you better get yourselves ready. There's plague coming. You know what a lot of people are saying? Oh, we prepared and made fools out of ourselves. That's what people are saying. We made fools out of ourselves once. Ha <laughs> not me. Man, my family laughed me right off, you know, right around the corner. My family laughed and hee-hauled and carried on. They won't be laughing and hee-hauling this time. Believe you me. Now, in the 22nd verse of that 6th chapter of Genesis, it says, Thus did Noah according to all, and you need to circle or underline the word all, that God commanded him. So did he. He did everything. He did it all. It does, and this, this is the thing that I, that I personally am concerned about as a prophet. I see people going to put, I've got, I've got a friend that's putting up food. Now he stopped by, and, and now he believes this, but he didn't practice any of it, okay? And so he stopped by the house, and, 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 he, and he began to talk to me and, and wanted to know my viewpoints about this and my viewpoints about that. And I said, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. Thus saith the prophet. I said, you're going to end up burying your son. He's got a son. You're going to end up burying your son, and your food's going to rot, or they're going to come in and steal it, may even shoot you in the process. And he looked at me and he said, well, I don't think I like that. And I said, you don't have to like it. But I said, that's what's going to happen to you because I'm going to tell you what you're doing. You're not doing what God said. See, storing up the food is only part of this thing. There is a spiritual aspect and there is a physical aspect of this thing. And it both has to be dealt with. And we're, go we're, going, to, we're going to deal with it. Uh, deal, deal with it. We're going to deal with it. Now, I, I want you to go into Revelation, the 14th chapter. The book of Revelation 14. And I want to give this to you, which, uh, which we talked about the 12th chapter before. The 14th chapter, in the 12th verse, it says, Here is the patience. Here is the persistence of the saints. Here are they that, again, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, who are they? They are the Messianic believers that are going to be on the face of this earth just prior to the Lord God's coming back. Now, we are in the last days. I don't think any of us have a problem at all with agreeing to the fact that, that that's where we're at. We're, we're, we're there, uh, probably closer than any of us really know, but we're there. The thing that we need to do and we need to agree upon is the fact the Lord is coming back. He's coming back again for, for a church, a people that's full of power and glory. And in order to reach that place of power and glory, something's going to have to change. Because in the book of Acts, the power and the glory of God was there. Now again, let me just reiterate for a second. The reason it was there was because they were keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, the Mashiach, the Messiah. All right? They were doing both. Now, turn with me in Matthew, the seventh chapter. Matthew 7, and I want to, I want to uh, use the 13th and 14th verses here. It says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be, uh, th there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, 
Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You need to underline those scriptures. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. He's, he's, not, he's not talking to the, the, the heathens. He's talking to the believers. And he's saying that it's straight. It's not wide. You know, you, you know we, we get to think, well, all I got to do is go to church. About half of Christianity believes because they went to church and, and bought a pew that went in the church that that's their ticket to heaven. And it's not their ticket to heaven. That's their ticket straight to hell is what's going to end up being for them. You have to receive, you have to receive Mashiach as the Son of Almighty God and believe that He came and He shed His blood. He did what He did and He sits at the right hand side of the Father after being dead for three days and going to return back into this earth. You must believe that. But you also must understand that that is the testimony of Mashiach, the Messiah. That is His testimony. And we are to keep that, and so we're so vividly told in, in, in the book of Revelation. Now, I want to I want to share this with you over in 21. Now, now, now he's talking to the church and he's saying, look, not, you know, that it's not narrow. I mean, it's not wide, it's very narrow. And few are going to find it. Few are going to find it. Now, what do you suppose is few? Listen, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now listen, many will say unto me that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Are these people saved? You bet they're saved. And in the, thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And that's what these are, they're going to say to him. These are, these, are, these are Holy Ghost filled folks. Now listen to 23. Then, and then will I profess unto them... I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I want you to underline the word iniquity, and you need to understand the misinterpretation. This properly interpreted goes like this. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work against the law. That is the way that was supposed to have been interpreted, and it wasn't. Folks, we are at a very, very, very serious turning point. It's the difference between living and dying. I think, I think Donna put it well. There's going to be a lot of people that's going to go, to go on to heaven, and that's going to be a contributor to the mercies of God. And I know when Donna told me that, I like to, I like to pull the car over, and, 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 and I, because at first it didn't sound right. I said, well, how could that be the mercies of God? She went through it, and I said, you know, you're right. Folks, we've got, the church has been so duped into believing that there's a rapture coming, and they don't have to worry about, they don't have to worry about, well, bless God being in here in the last days and everything else, but let me, let me say this to you, and you stop and you think about that. If we're all children of God, and we are, and that's the reason I said there's not two peoples, there's only one, then why would God take part of the family off this earth in a rapture and leave the Jews, the house of Judah, the little tribe of Benjamin, the Benjamites, and those of, of, of the tribe of Levi, why would he leave them here to go through all this? Why? Number one, they don't even have, the, they don't even have Yeshua. They, now they will have that one point in turning, but let me tell you something. The church always thought, and I always used to say, well, who's going to teach them? And then I finally got to a point about 20 years ago of saying, okay, you all go ahead and rapture, I'm staying to help them out. Okay? I'm going to stay and help them out because they're going to need some help. They're not going to make this thing by themselves. I mean, you, you take the experience that God has put in this prophet through the years that I've done this thing, they can, they're not going to have enough years to get that kind of experience. Well, God will do a quick work in the last days. Yeah, He will. But I'm going to tell you something. We're going to be there in the midst of it. So understand what I'm saying. Now, Revelation 22, and then, we're going to, then I'm going to get on with this thing. Revelation 22. I want you to look, I want you to look closely at this. The last, now, this is the last chapter of the book of Revelation. All right? Now, in the 14th verse, it says, Blessed are they that do His commandments. Okay? That they may have right to the tree of life. Now, remember what the Lord Yeshua said. Straight and narrow is the way. Few thereby are going to find it. Now, what are you saying? Blessed are they that do His commandments. Not just hear them. That they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. The gate isn't narrow for them, is it? 
They will enter into the gate. Prophetically, you receive, you receive that. Now, let's talk for a minute about, the, about the, the commandments that you need to keep. All right? Most of which don't pertain any longer to us because the temple is no longer there. All right? And we need to understand that the Lord God, when He said... And of course, you know, most of the church says, yes, I believe in the Ten Commandments. And, and I said, well, that's wonderful, but you must only, must only be nine because you don't believe in the Sabbath. Okay, so you believe in nine commandments instead of ten. And the fact of it is, God said to remember the Sabbath. And the reason he said remember, he evidently knew we were going to forget, didn't he? And then as I said, Constantine's mama come along and decided that the Christians were going to have their own Sabbath. She become, from being a heathen, she become a Christian. She even went to Jerusalem and built a church. And she told Constantine, she said, now look, we're going to pass a law and we're going to have a Christian Sabbath. Now what was Constantine's mama saying? There's two peoples, okay, there's two peoples, there's the Jews, and then there's us Christians that God loves much more than those Jews. So we're going to have, what we're going to do is we're going to have, uh, bless God, a, 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 a Sunday Sabbath instead of a Saturday Sabbath. Now did that impress God? Not one iota. Now we let a woman... By the name of, I forget what her name is, Constantine's mama is what a voice called her. She does have a name. But we let her coerce the church into believing a lie. The church has carried that through generation after generation after generation. The Sabbath is Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. Our day runs from that to that. Not, our day doesn't run from the first stroke after midnight that the Gregorian calendar uh, produces for us. That's not, that's not, the, way, that's not the, our, the way our life is run. Now, you need to understand that Sabbath is to be kept. If you don't know how to keep Sabbath, I, I think we got a, a, a tapes back there on Sabbath. Is there two hours? There's three hours on Sabbath, how to keep it. I, I, I'm going to do a, a video before long, uh, and Don and I are going to go through the entire Sabbath meal. The prayers, the Hebrew prayers. Hebrew is not a hard language to learn. The prayers definitely aren't hard to learn. And, and you can you, you stay tuned, stay, stay in touch with us. And when we get that done, you can, you can get a hold of that. And then you can begin to hold Sabbath meals. The fact of it is, there's two loaves of braided, uh, braided bread that goes on a table. The knives are covered because we don't believe in, we don't believe in war. Evidently, because we know that we've had to be in war, but we don't believe in bloodshed. The fact of it is the two candles are lit by the woman. The prayer is prayed by the woman, welcoming Sabbath and bringing the light into her. And it's common known in, 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 by the Jews anyway that there was a woman that took the light out of the world and there's a woman now at her place to bring the light back into her and her family. We pray a prayer over what's called the Kaddish, the wine. We pray a prayer over what's called the washing of hands, which is back there on the table. I think it's a single tape or is that a single tape that's back there? Uh, we do do that prayer. We pray over. We pray over the the bread, and we pull the bread. It's never cut. It's pulled. We put salt on the bread, so we remember that that we had to work by the sweat of our brow. And we do those things in what in relationship. We bless the children, as as the Lord God uh, told us that we were to bless them. We bring all that forth. The, we we have the meal. We celebrate the Lord God. And you want to know something? Let me, tell, let me show you the difference between, between uh, the way God does things and commands things to be done. The Jews pray after the meal and thank God for the meal that they had. Christians only pray before the meal, don't they? You say, well, Jesus prayed for the bread and broke it in the past. Yeah, he did, and it's okay. But I'm just what I'm trying to tell you is there's other ways that things are done. There's nothing wrong with praying before the meal. I, I always pray before the meal, all right? If anything, you have to practice remembering to thank God when the meal's over. But there are, that is, that is Sabbath. Every, every sundown on Friday, that is Sabbath. Has to be kept. You do no work unless you've got to do work. Pull the docks and see what Jesus wasn't against Sabbath. What the Lord Yeshua was trying to say is, look, if the ox is in the ditch, pull it out. That's what he was saying. He didn't say don't keep it. If you've got, if you have to, if you have to, if your car is broken and you've got to go to work, bless God, uh, the next day, and God doesn't expect you to miss work or to lose your job, you better go get the car fixed. All right, now you can tell you, now, now don't use, don't use, don't use that for an excuse that you don't keep Sabbath. That's not, that's not what this is about. This is a heart thing. Okay, so you got to remember, now there are other Sabbaths. All right, there are other Sabbaths, the festivals. 
and which we're going to talk about in a minute, have, have some of what have Sabbaths involved in them. The Lord said, and you will have a Sabbath with tabernacles that we just, uh, Sukkot, that we just came through. And by the way, the Lord Yeshua was, was born on Sukkot, not, not the 25th of December. And it's not called Christmas either. He was born in a sukkah, not a manger. It's a sukkah. Now, these Sabbaths that you keep, you keep them also like you keep a regular Sabbath, all right? And the Lord will dictate those through the sort of festivals. Now, new moon. We are commanded to keep new moon. Now, I'm not going to go through that. We got that back there too, don't we? That's back there on tape. Uh, the, the scriptures are back there for that. Uh, but you understand, the new moon candle is to be lit. It's, you, run it for, you keep it lit for 24 hours. And then there are a set of prayers that, that we pray. Now, you can, you can get those prayers uh, simply by emailing us. And we'll, uh, in fact, we probably will just run them prayers up on the net and, and then they can, they can print them off. So make a note of that, uh, Donna. Uh, the festival, now Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year, we came through that. Yom Kippur, the day of repentance. Let me, let me just say something about, about that festival. Most of us think and believe that God only has one book in heaven. It's a, it's a book of life. You're wrong. There are books, all right? There is a book that if you keep this festival, Rosh Hashanah, and you go through Yom Kippur, the, the, the day of repentance, all right? You go through this and do what God tells you to do. Then your name is written in a book and sealed for the next entire year until Rosh Hashanah comes again. Okay? Now, it is sealed giving you good fortune because you did what? You kept the commandment of keeping Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, Sukkot, as we said, is a feast of tabernacles. That's, that's the next one. Pesach, which is called Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We keep that one. Uh, that's not hard. I don't think we got that one back there. Shavat or Pentecost, which is the Feast of Weeks. We keep that one. Now, that's not that tough to keep. They're not hard to keep. In fact, they're not grievous at all to keep. People say, well, what about those kosher laws? Well, I'm going to tell you something about the kosher laws. And, and uh, you don't, uh, that, that, you're not going to get in trouble with God for not keeping the kosher laws as much as you are about not keeping these festivals and new moon and Sabbath. All right? You've got to understand something about the kosher laws. The kosher laws were given so that you'd be healthy. Do you understand that the Jews are the healthiest people on the face of this earth? You know that? And you know why? Because they only eat what God tells them to eat. That you'll find out that, bless God, you know, I, I, that, the way things happen for me and in my life, it's just always like the circumstances always take place. And so all of a sudden, I'm, I'm pondering, now this is a number of years back, as to the kosher laws, and, and, I, and I'm, 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 well, I like pork, okay? I mean, I don't see anything wrong with pork. You don't see anything wrong with pork. I mean, that was back then. There was something wrong with pork back then, and that's the reason God said don't eat it. Ah, amen, hallelujah, I vote for that, Lord. That's the way I see it. That's what the preacher said. And you want to know what? Huh, I read an article that was done by not a Jewish guy. And it said this, that people that eat pork are going to contract diseases, especially in their older life, because of the, and it went through the makeup of pork. I go, well, maybe God knew something here. Now, what are we really saying? That God, you know, we get to thinking God's stupid, don't we? When it comes to the kosher laws, we get to thinking that, bless God, that he, he must really be stupid to think, well, in today's modern world, it's all right to eat. No, it's not all right to eat that stuff. Well, God tells you, and in this part of the country, we are catfish-eating people, aren't we? It's not kosher. The reason it's not kosher? Because they don't, have, they don't have scales. Catfish don't have scales. God said, don't eat anything. You don't have scales. Now, you want to know something? I just had a friend here that's, uh, let's see, I think Joe was, what, six years younger than me, and, and he just died recently. And you know what? It ended up being over. It ended up being over catfish or something like that. He ate it all the time. And because he began to have all kind of problems, and one of the things that, one of the things that was asked of him, do you eat a lot of catfish? He said, I have about 150 pounds of it in my freezer right now. Now, is God wrong? No, God's never wrong. The only thing with the kosher law was, was God was trying to do what? See to it that we stayed healthy. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Not for me and my family. There's not. Now, there may be yours. Now, let's talk about the things that you're going to need, and I'm going to try to talk about the things that, other than what Donna talked about in the last 30 minutes here or so. Uh, you're going to have to consider water. There's no doubt about it. You need to get a water filter. You need to get a good one. 
You need to get one that, bless God, that if you have to go down to the local stream, the local ditch, the local river, that you can process water. Now, I carry filters with me around this world, uh, ceramic filters, that I can take water literally right out of the rivers and, and uh, process it and, and drink it. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is that when this plague comes, it may be that they won't have enough people. If everybody is sick and everything's quarantined, it may be that water may become a very scarce commodity, all right? So you're going to have to think about that. You're going to think about, and Donna told you that one teaspoon of, of, of bleach for every five gallon of water stored, uh, uh, that, bless God, you can, you know, you, 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 can, you can store water. You need, and there's tablets that you can put into water. You need to look into those things. You need to consider heat. And what's going to happen if the power plants can't produce and you don't have the, you don't have the, the heat that's going to come into your homes through, through what you could use for a furnace and electricity running the furnace or baseboard heat or whatever that is. You're going to have to consider wood or kerosene. Now, if you're going to consider wood or kerosene, obviously you're going to have to, you're going to, have to put enough wood up. If you don't have a fireplace, fireplaces are not effective and efficient because they lose about 70% of their heat right up the chimney. What I would suggest to you, if you have a fireplace, check to see what it would cost to buy an insert into the fireplace, which would let it become, what, a wood-burning stove, which would be a whole lot more uh, efficient. All right? Now, if you're going to store kerosene, you're going to have to figure out how much kerosene it would take to heat your home for a day and then multiply it out. Now, let me tell you what I have done. We have containers. Now, you can go to the farm stores and you can buy everything from a container about that size to one big enough to fill that corner over there and about eight foot tall. Well, whatever you need to do and, and begin to put kerosene in. You need to put gasoline. You need to start storing up, some, storing up gasoline and it will keep for a while, all right? Now, talk about generators. If you can afford a generator, it would be smart to get a generator. And the reason to be smart to get a generator that if, in fact, you don't have lights, and I'm going to tell you that, uh, that I've seen enough vision to know that there's going to be times when, when electricity isn't, in other words, in the third world, I go places where they have electricity uh, from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then there isn't any more until the next day, all right? Now, there's a possibility that we could have that kind of thing even happen during this. So again, if you have a generator, why would you want a generator? You need to keep a, ref a refrigerator not your whole house, you need to keep a freezer. If you don't have a freezer, you may consider wanting to get one. It takes just a few, a few minutes to run in the generator to keep your refrigerator and your freezer up where they're working. Okay, then you can just shut it off and, and they'll sit. I, I used to know, I don't know now, how many days a freezer will be okay without, a, you know, if you don't keep open and shut it. Same thing with refrigerators. You don't want to start opening and shut those things all the time. Just do as you need to do. So you got to know how much gasoline. You got to know how much kerosene, and you need to work toward that. Now, you should probably get nails and screws to have a few of those things around in case there's some things you need to repair. There's masks that you can get the doctors and nurses wearing. There's a big run on these right now. They're made by 3M Company. And they're saying now that there's a shortage in these masks because everybody's running around. You know, well, after the government finally fessed up to the fact that this, this uh, uh, Tamron uh, serum that they have is not going to insulate you, if that's a decent enough word, from the avian flu, then everybody started to decide they'd run out and get these masks to wear. All right, so, so you may want to consider getting some masks to wear, okay? But here's the key, you've got to stay in. All right, now let's talk, about, let's talk about you staying in. What are you going to do when the people that call you crazy come to your door? Now listen to me, they will come. They will come. Don't you think they won't? When people get hungry, they'll do anything. And some of you are going to see people do some pretty rotten things, I'm afraid. But you're going to have to understand some things, and, I'm, I, and that's the reason I, I want you to really grasp on to what I'm saying. We need to, as children of God, understand we are about to move into the miraculous. The church doesn't know anything about the miraculous because the church doesn't even know how to work the works of God. But we're going to move into the miraculous. Those of us that are willing, those of us that, 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 that will be bold enough to keep these commandments, to keep the testimony of Yeshua, we're going to move into, uh, get ourselves into place to receive. 
And, and, and the miraculous is an area that the church, again, doesn't know anything about, but you're going to, all right? So the people come to the door, and they say, and they say it's family, and, well, we're sorry, we should have listened, we made fun of you, and we're sorry, but you know what that doesn't do? That doesn't add more food to your, to your stores, does it? That, that, that doesn't, all that's going to do is you stand there and look at them, and I think what God has said would be neat if God just shut the door, right? But God's not going to just shut the door, I don't think. So you're going to have to deal with it. So the first thing you're going to have to do, you're going to have to say, look, this avian flu, now it's been told by the World Health Organization that you have it for 48 hours before you know you got it, and you'll be spreading the disease for 48 hours and not even know you're spreading it. Anything that you touch, anything that, anything that you touch, that, that flu is going to stay on there for six days. Wasn't that right, Donna? Six days. A regular virus, just a few hours, if you touch it, it'll be gone. This flu stays for six days, and everybody that touches the door handle going in and out of the store, then they touch their face, then they've got it, all right? So that's what's going to go on. So you don't want these people, if you're going to let them in, and which you probably will, you're going to have to let them do something. If you've got a storage building, fix it up where there's a bed or something in it, some heat, something to eat, so they can stay there for 48 hours to see if they're, go if they're going to come down. Now listen, you cannot bring them in your home hoping that, bless God, that they don't have the avian flu. You can't do that. You don't want to take that kind of a chance because that's a device of Satan. You have prepared, you have sought God through prayer and hopefully fasting, and you've put up your stores, you've done exactly what God has told you through the prophets, and bless God, you don't want to throw it all out the window because son Joey's there that didn't want to listen to anything you had to say, but now he's there to be taken in. Well, take him in, but you let him go through that 48 hours to make sure that he, that he doesn't have the avian flu. All right, if he does, I'm not, I don't know what to tell you to do because then you're going to face another problem. And, but, that, but you've got to understand something. Again, everybody that gets this flu is going to need to be hospitalized. It's not, again, it's not a flu that you lay down in bed, have aches and pains, run a fever, and it's over. It doesn't happen that way. Now, the people that die aren't going to live very long. What's the longest they've had anybody live, Donna? I think it's been about a week, I think. So, uh, well, I think it's a little longer than that. I think it was 13 days, actually. Closer to two weeks, probably. And so, that, so, anyway, that, that, that's going to be quick. Now, enough food for you and your family for a year. If you'll put that much up, uh, th this thing won't go on a year. So, I said earlier, I'm going to believe that God, when, he, when the time comes, is going to let me pray, going to let me fast, and I'm going to be able to stay that thing when God tells me to stay it. And, and I believe that. Uh, but if you'll put up for a year, and you'll do it as of, uh, let's say if there's four in your family... Put up, put up for enough for four of you and the family. You'll have extra food. You'll have extra provision. And that's going to be important when these people come. And then somebody said, well, just how long is that going to last? I don't know. God didn't show me in the vision. And I could stand up here and guess all day. But guessing isn't what you need. All right? You need, you need facts. Now, uh, <clears throat> people coming uh, to rob you of your, your food and what should you do about it? Now, when people get hungry, they become desperate. Now, do you remember down in, you remember down in New Orleans down, uh, when the guy came up and he said on national TV, he said, it's a real shame when we've got to go steal from our own. They don't, need to, they don't need to lose their food, but we're starving and we've got to do something, so we, were, we stole it from them. When people get hungry, they become desperate. And when they find out you've got food, they will be at your door if they are desperate. They'll be there. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll get the gun and shoot them. Well, yeah, you, <laughs> you just have to do what you've got to do. But listen, before you, you go out and buy yourself a bunch of ammunition, you need to understand that God is a supernatural God. As I said earlier, He's going to move us into the miraculous, but the people that are not going to move into the miraculous, uh, are not going to, are the, they're going to be the people that do not keep the law. They have the witness of, of the Lord Yeshua. Now, when all this comes down, and it's very important to understand this. Dealing with God is a lot like this. You do this and He'll do that. If you don't do this, He can't do that. You keep the commandments and you keep the testimony or the witness of Yeshua, then He will do this over here. He will do this. And it makes no difference what He's got to do or what extent that He's got, he's got to go through to do it. Now, years ago, God gave me a couple visions, and I'm going to share them with you. And He said, and so shall it be in the last days. And I was standing, and there was two men that was coming with a gun, or with guns, and they were going to kill me. And I panicked. I could feel inside. You know, when you, when you see something, you, I mean, you're, you're inside, you, boy, what's going on? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I said, 
what should I do? And the Lord said, you point and say my name. And I pointed and I said the name of the Lord and they fell dead. And the Lord said, and so shall it be in the last days. Now, and you're saying, oh my, I, 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 just, don't, I just don't think God would do something like that. Well now, don't, don't, don't be so sure. Don't, don't be so sure because God does do things like that. I could write a large book about the miraculous things that God has to do for me when I, when I travel into the third world and the things that I've seen Him do uh, time and time again. God will do whatever it takes. And, but, but I'm going to tell you something. In order to move into the miraculous, you're going to have to start thinking miraculous. You're going to have to start thinking past yourself and understand something. That, bless God, you're going to have to call those things which be not as though they are. You're going to have to understand that. You're going to have to receive that. Now, what's going to, what, so, so you're saying, Brother Decker, that all you're going to do is just point a finger. Let me tell you something. If it, let's, let's put it this way. So, so you get in a position and somebody comes in and steals your food. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to have to go steal somebody else's or die. No, you're not. The other vision that God gave me. Me and my family was sitting around the Sabbath table. There was no food on the table. There wasn't any food to be had. We had lit the Sabbath candles, the Shabbat candles, prayed the prayers, and we had held hands, and, and I began to pray and thank God and ask God to manifest a feast on the table for me. Now, this is a vision. And when we opened our eyes, there was a full-fledged turkey dinner like our Thanksgiving dinners on that table. Again, the Lord God said, and so shall it be in that day, son, prophesied. Let the people understand. Now, you're looking at me like a, a dog with a new bowl. But I'm here to tell you this God that we serve is a mightier God than the church has ever, let, ever represented Him to be. We have limited a limitless God. And He will not be limited in this last day. He's going to do. Didn't He bring manna? Didn't He not bring manna down from heaven? Did He not feed three and a half, four and a, four, four and a half million people every day, six days a week, and on the sixth day gave them enough? that would go through the Shabbat, the Sabbath? Now let me tell you something else about how, how serious that Sabbath thing was when it all, back in that day, you said, well, that was back then before Jesus came. Well, let's listen closely to me. If you worked on a Sabbath, they took you out and killed you. They didn't fool with you. Now, now well, why would they make up a rule like that? They didn't, God did. That's how important, folks, and people said, well, the Sabbath isn't important. I'm going to tell you what. The Sabbath is important enough that when you understand when the Lord Yeshua comes back to this, back to this earth, He will implement the Sabbath. Not, not, not the Sunday Sabbath that we don't keep anyway. You know, I had somebody say, well, we keep the Sunday Sabbath. I said, no, you don't. No, 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 no. You, you go, well, we go to church. I said, no, ah, no, no, I'm sorry. You don't buy and you don't sell on the Sabbath. Nobody come in your gates that buys and sells on the Sabbath. You do no work. You come before the Lord your God. You hold a holy convocation on Saturday or Friday night, not Sunday. Folks, can you understand why we became an abomination to God? Why we got ourselves in position? Well, how could this ever come? God would never send a plague. We don't even know enough about God, how God brings judgment. But God brings judgment many times through nature. Many times through what we're seeing, this, this virus, this disease is like this. God can do it in floods. He can do it, with, he can do it in earthquakes. And my Lord and my God. And, and, and I, you know, I, I came up the other day. I was praying. And I, I sat there for a little while. And I said, you know, Lord. I said, the wild thing of it is we have seen all this turmoil take place all over this nation. And I said, I know it's not because it just happens to be that I live here in the Midwest. But you know something? We have escaped most of that, haven't we? Huh? Get ready. We're not going to. We're not going to. Why? Because we're not exempt from this thing. It just hadn't been our turn yet, but it's coming. I don't know what it is. God hadn't showed it to me yet. When he does, I'll, I'll post it or let the, you can see it on the internet. Now, with pointing our fingers and understanding these things and how they come, you have to realize the things in which God is doing and how he's getting ready to do them. Now, throughout the, the, throughout the history of, of these scriptures, we have watched God prepare and take care of his people. And I think the thing that you need to get seriously down into your spirit, man, is that, that God is going to take care of you. If you do that, he'll do this. If you don't do that, he can't do this. 
And see, and I, and, I, and I believe that when you go back and study and you begin to realize that somewhere along the line, we came up with this idea that was so slick, well, let's don't worry about going through a tribulation. Let's just tell them all that we're going to rapture off this earth. So that took care of that part. And, 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 and you know, and don't worry about those, those commandments because, I mean, after all, we're keeping Easter and Halloween and all that. We're in modern times, right? We're doing the modern time thing. Went by a church the other day, they're selling, selling pumpkins. you never seen so many pumpkins in all my life sitting in front of a church. I said, dear God in heaven. I said, it's come to this, had it? Selling pumpkins. I was preaching against Halloween back in the 60s. I had people, I had preachers threatening my life over, over me taking the Halloween parties out of their basement. If you can imagine that. They saw nothing wrong with it. They just thought that. But you see, that's what we did. We traded off the things of God for the things of this world. What, what, what did the Lord say? Because of your traditions as unto man. And that's what we did. We didn't keep the things of God. What we did, we kept the things of man. We let man. Like I said, who, who, who voted about this thing about Sabbath? Constantine's mama did. The church didn't vote. The pastors didn't vote. The prophets sure didn't vote. But ever since then, and now we come to the point now where we're back to the place of understanding something. It's not working. What are we going to do to make it work? Let's go to Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, and I'm going to close. The book of Ezekiel. God has had a system. And I think within the system which God has, we're going to have to pay, pay some close and uh, uh, very close attention. Now, God was about to bring judgment. And before God brought judgment, God spoke. And I'm going to start in the third verse, and we're going to go down through seven. And the glory of the, of, of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherubims, where upon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said in, in, in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man whom upon this is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary, then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew the city. Now, there are a number of ceilings, if you will. We, we read where 144,000, uh, 12 of each of the tribes of Israel will be sealed. Uh, that is not the only ceiling that's going to take place. Uh, God had a way of sealing His people. Now, these uh, obviously this 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 angel went b forth, and this was an invisible. It was not a physical mark of ink on their foreheads. Okay, it was not. It was supernatural, and God sealed them with that. Now, I as I said when I think when I started this evening, I've got I've got people all over the third world sealing the peoples that we deal with in the third world that are in the churches and the things that we have established. And they are sealing them. What else? They can't put up food. They don't have any food. They don't have, they don't have the luxuries that you and I have. They can't, they can't go run down and say, well, I think we'll get a case of tuna this week. And No, they don't even know what tuna is. Bless God, uh, they, they, they don't have it. They starve about half the time. And that's as much as even what we can do to help them. So the fact something had to happen, and I cried out to the Lord, and I said, Lord, what, what, what's, going to have, what's going to have to take place? I said, these people, I said, these are my brothers, these are my sisters, these are my children. I said, I, I can't stand, I can't stand back and, and watch, and watch, and watch as this, this plague comes and destroys all them because they don't have the money to go put up food. And the Lord said, tell them to seal. Tell the, tell, tell the pastors to take the oil of the prophet that I left in, the, left in these places. Tell them to take the prophet's oil and place that oil upon their foreheads. They'll be sealed into these last days. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's some excited people around this world. And, it, it, you know, th th there's going to be stories. 
There's going to be stories that are going to be told years and years down the road here because this is going to work for them. Why is it going to work for them? Because there's no alternatives for them. There isn't any alternatives for them. There's alter alternatives for you and I. Now, let me, let me, let me close in, 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 in saying this. What are we going to do about the loved ones that won't keep the commandments and the testimony of Yeshua. They'll keep the testimony, but they will not keep the commandments. What are we going to do about that? Are they, are they going to die? Well, now let me tell you something, Mama and Dad. Somebody along the line has got to do something right. See, and I've always said that. If you don't do things right for yourself, do it for your children. Somebody is going to do this thing right. And the people that will keep the commandments... Those people, bless God, God is going to allow them to pray. Did not Abraham pray and Lot and his family come out of Sodom? Do you know why? So I'm going to tell you something. Lot wasn't living a, a, an uptown Christian life, folks. He was right there in the midst of all those homosexuals and living there. Now, the fact of it is that God honored the prayers of Abraham. Why did he honor him? Because he said, Abraham, if you'll do this, I'll do that. Abraham did this, and he did that. You can make a difference for those in your family if you'll keep the commandments and you'll get yourself into this thing and get it done right. I believe you can intercede and you can pray and God will seal them. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Not everybody, there's going to be a lot that will be drawn to God after this is over. As, as Donna said, there's, God's going to be merciful to some and take some home, and, and I realize that. I think the key is to always remember one thing. God loved us first, okay? He loves us. He cares about us. There is no fear in this thing. Uh, as I said, we're about to walk into the miraculous, folks. We're about to walk into what Peter and Paul only could think about. And you know, I've said before, the day's going to come, and I believe that. I believe when I get to, the, get to heaven... I believe Peter and Paul is going to come up to me and they're going to say, tell us, prophet, what was it like working the greater works? Tell us. Because God chose you and you were able to be there. Tell us, tell us, tell us what it was all about. Tell us about the greater works. And I intend to be able to sit down and tell them about the greater works. And you can do the same thing. But we can't do it unless we are willing to change. People don't change very well. The church is going to dig their heels in. Do you think the church is going to change? No, I don't think the church is going to change. I think the church is going to call us devils, and I think they're going to keep calling us devils, and I think they're going to go on about their business like they've always gone about their business. The transition came, and bless God, passed the Catholic church centuries ago. Is there still a Catholic church? You bet there is. So the fact of it is, God is doing what? He is pouring new wine into new wine skins. All right? That's what God's doing. It will not, it's not going to go, it's not, this isn't something that's going to, going to be given to the church. Well, here it is, church, just take and do something with it. You know why? Because the church is into religion. The church couldn't see this. Again, they got eyes. If they want to see, they can see. They have elected not to see because of religion. All right? You and I have been given eyes to see. We, we now, we can understand. Have you ever wondered why, why can't those people see what we see? You know, I'm going, I've got hours on tape about this thing. And I, 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 why can't they see? Why can't they understand? What is it about all this? I'm not smarter than the next guy. And then finally, I realized, God gave me eyes to see. To them, they don't, they don't have those eyes to see as of yet. Now, again, at any given point in time that they wish to see, they can see. But they're going to have to decide that they want to see. And if they don't want to see, they never will see. Amen? So what I'm going to do tonight, we're going to do, I brought some oil. Now, I pour oil, okay? And I don't want to pay for the carpet. And Donna can tell you, when the prophet pours oil, you're going to have, you're going to have more oil running down on you than you ever dreamed about. We bring, we get, have to bring it by the gallons when I pour oil, all right? Uh, so, so I, I, you know, I, I prayed about all this, and what I did was I, I brought some oil, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to place this oil on your forehead, just, just, a, just a, a bit of it, and I'm going to believe that, that that bit of oil on your forehead is going to have the name of our God, all right? And I believe that that's going to seal you. Now, let me tell you something about this. It's going to seal you if you keep the commandments. 
Now, there is something else you're going to have to know about this, and I've got to tell you. I mean, it sounds great to get sealed, okay? It sounds great to say, well, I'm going to keep the commandments and don't even know what they are. It sounds great to do it. Now, listen, there's another side of that sword. Don't you ever, ever come and let this prophet pour oil on you and you decide that you're not going to do it. Because this same blessing will come home to curse you and your family. And that's the way it works with prophets. If you're serious about this thing, and you may not know anything about it, but you're going to pursue it, and you're going to do it, then you need to come. And you need to let me, you let, let, need to let me place that oil upon you. If you don't know whether you're going to or not, do yourself a favor, and do yourself a family a favor, just pass. All right, just pass and think, well, it'll blow over and probably isn't going to do anything anyway. So I didn't miss out on anything. And then down the road, you're going to hear and you're going to understand how all the rest of it is going to work. Amen. So we're going to do that. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do that. And then I want to pray. I want to pray for the people that are here that are needing prayer. Uh, what I, and I don't want to keep people because when I start praying for people, sometimes people, you know, get, get tired of sitting there. And you, we've been here a long time and I appreciate you coming and staying this long with us. Uh, if you're interested in us coming back, you need to let us know. I, I'm, I'm here in the States for a while. I, I don't know how long. I'm almost afraid to, to, to ask God how long it's going to be. My heart's in the third world, but right now this is what God's got me doing, and I'm going to do it. If you're interested in having us come back, there is an interest in... How do I want to put this? There is an interest in having Holy Ghost-filled synagogues messianic synagogues all right all across this country that i've traveled the problem today with the the messianic movement they're not filled with the holy ghost they're a hakodesh most of them are far from them it won't work without the holy ghost it wasn't intended to work without it and it won't and so uh you need to you need to you need to think about it if you're if you're not going to church somewhere uh you know we we, we got uh, sam and paula that's here uh bless god and some of the rest of you the others are here I, I can't be here all the time. There's no doubt about it. I, I can, I, I, at best, I'll be the prophet over it. Now, that can be good, bad, and ugly. That can be a blessing. It can be the other side of the sword. But the fact of it is, I, I think that the Lord would let me do that. In fact, I've got no, nothing saying that I can't. You would have to make those decisions. Now, I know there's not many of us here, and there's probably as many of you have traveled getting here as there are that are here, okay? And we appreciate that. But what I want to say to you is this. That God is going to get this thing done, and He will get it done. There will be something that will open up that will work, work right. It's got to open up. It's got to work. It's got to put the Lord Yeshua in the right place, put the law in the right place, and the power of God's anointing has to be present. Has to be present to destroy the yoke for this thing to work. Why? Because it's going to turn the heads. It's going to turn the heads, and it is going to bring what we're going to do. We're going to provoke Israel to jealousy. When they see us keeping the law. See, people thought we were going to provoke them to uh, jealousy having the Messiah. No, that's, no, they've long since decided that's not right. No, that's not going to provoke. What's going to provoke them to jealousy is people like me keeping the law. People like me, bless God, laying hands on the blind and they start seeing. The lame start walking. The disease are healed and saying, thank you, Lord. That's, what, that's what's going to provoke them. Why? Because the law is going to work for us. The law, long since, has not worked for them. You know when I told you that the, the, uh, in Egypt, it worked back there for them, but it quit. And they never got to themselves. Another. Partly in, in relationship to the fact that God blinded them, okay? So let's not think that they're just downright stupid. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say that at all. But the fact of it is, we are, we are coming to that era and to that time. Now, what I want to do first is, I want to take up a collection. And I believe this, I want to set this chair up here. And as you come up here, if it, well, that chair don't come undone, does it? Has that got to do this? There we go. I'm going to set this chair up here, and as you come up here and put your money in this, I'm going to lay hands on you. The Bible says that if you bless a prophet, if you take care of a prophet, then the prophet is to bless you. And I want to bless you tonight. Some of you in this room need your finances blessed anyway, all right? And so what I want to do is I, I want you to, I'm going to pray. I want you to come. And as you come, I'm just going to lay my hands on you and ask God to bless you. You go back and sit down. Then we're going to do the thing with the oil. And we're going to get that done. I was going to do the thing with the oil as people came up. And then I decided, no, I was going to do it separately. I was going to have you put it in and put oil on you. But some of you may not want that oil put on you, okay? So let's pray. Father, we thank you. I glorify And I want you to I want you to look in Second Timothy with me. 
I want to give a few scriptures, then I'm going to go into the things that, uh, that God's dealing with me about, has dealt with me about, and we'll, uh, we'll see what uh, comes of all that. 2 Timothy 3, and I, I, I'm going to start in the first verse. The, the Apostle Paul here was, was talking very earnestly about the last days, and he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, now, those, that word perilous, in my margin, says dangerous. Dangerous times will come, or shall come, so we're promised that. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, I don't think any of us in this room can say, oh, I don't think we have any of that going on. It's going on everywhere. I mean, you, any, anything that you read there is, is prime time to us today in the world that we live in. The, the fifth verse says, having a form of godliness. And that's what I want to concentrate on here for just a few moments. The church today has a form of godliness. We go through all the right agendas. We say all the right things. But as I keep saying, we don't produce the manifestation of God in our meetings. And when I talk about the manifestation of God, I, I'm talking about the manifestation of His anointing, of Him being there. Not, 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 not thinking that, bless God, that all we've got to do is pray. You know, a lot of people work in faith. And there's nothing wrong with faith. Let me tell you about it. I work for the anointing. I, I, you know, and it doesn't make any difference whether you believe or you don't believe when we get ready to pray for you tonight. Those